Hüseyin Besiuni, Director of Neurosurgical Clinics, Clinicum Amberg and Biden, Bavaria, Germany. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. At least in Germany, it's evening. Um, I'm... Okay. I hope you can see my... Yeah, we can see the screen. You're gonna make it bigger, right? Yes. Um... Yeah, uh, okay. So... Perfect, perfect. I, I think perfect. Supposed... perfect. Yeah, before beginning um, um, of my talk, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I, yeah, I wish to... Um, uh, express my uh, deep-hearted uh, condolences uh, to my friends and colleagues of the uh, Brazilian Neurosurgical Society uh, for the loss of uh, yeah a great teacher and world-renowned uh, neurosurgeon, Professor uh, Bando de Oliveira, who unfortunately passed away two, day, two days ago. So um, yeah, we the world has lost a great uh, neurosurgeon. So my topic today um, is retractless microsurgery via the pterodactyl approach. And uh, thank you, Professor Shah, for this uh, very beautiful introduction. And uh, so I can build on it. Um, um, and uh, you, you know that uh, retractors have a long tradition. Actually, they um, um, since the beginning of uh, neurosurgery, and these are two historical images uh, from um, the book of a famous uh, uh, German uh, neurosurgical pioneer, Fedor Krause uh, of 1908, showing the uh, retractors, uh, which is, at this uh, time were not uh, fixed retractors, but they were held by the assistant who uh, was assisting the neurosurgery. So in accordance to the philosophy of uh, Professor Roton to make surgery more accurate, gentle and safe, um, um, I think the retractless micro surgery is a, is a way to achieve this. And uh, some years ago in 2012, Professor Spetzler um, uh, published um, an article, he called it a quiet revolution. And he came to the conclusion that fixed retraction can be supplanted by dynamic retraction with surgical instruments, limiting the risk of retractor-induced uh, tissue edema and injury. And retractorless uh, neurosurgery is an achievable goal even when complete uh, lesions, the complex lesions of the vasculature and skull waves are uh, being treated. So in accordance, uh, accordance to this, um, on, uh, to achieve this, you have to become very familiar with the neuroanatomy, um, which has just been shown, and of course, in-depth neuroanatomy uh, of also of the intracranial space, and in-depth um, um, knowledge of the basal cisterns. And this is um, maybe the first um, very sophisticated and very accurate uh, study of the um, um, nervous system and of the meninges and of the uh, cisterns. Uh, this was published in 1875 uh, by two um, uh, neuroscientists, Axel Key and Gustav Fretzius, uh, uh, Swedish neuroscientists at the Karolinska Institute, and on the right side, you can see uh, that they already very accurately described the Sylvian fissure and the Sylvian um, uh, cistern, the um, uh, olfactory cistern and the carotid cistern, uh, which were just also shown in the first presentation beside the cisterns of the posterior cranial fossa. 
So uh, as you of course know that Professor Yashagir also stressed this uh, point um, and uh, gave a good uh, overview of the basal cisterns. So this image was taken from this um, volume one of microneurosurgery. And uh, during the peroneal approach, the um, cisterns of most relevance um, are the sylvian cistern, the carotid cistern, or, or the, you, 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 you reach them, and the chiasmatic cistern. Maybe also the lamina terminalis cistern as an entrance to the third ventricle. If you are going more uh, to the front, you, uh, can, you will open the olfactory cistern. And if you go more posterior, you will open the cruel ambient and uh, the interpuncular cistern. So this is the peroneal view from the book of Professor Yashagil showing the uh, peroneal uh, view um, where you can see the um, olfactory nerve and this, its uh, cistern, the sylvian cistern with the MCA, M1 and M2 branches. Uh, the internal carotid artery with this, uh, its associated uh, um, carotid cistern, the optic nerve, chiasm, contralateral optic nerve with its um, um, chiasmatic cistern, and the carotid bifurcation, the A1 and M M1 uh, branches. So uh, to give you um, in also an anatomical um, view of this. Uh, this is the first uh, um, uh, case presentation. A six-year-old man with intractable epileptic fits. He had a uh, left limbic glioma of, uh, involving the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the parachyonhippocampal gyrus, as seen on the preoperative um, MRI left sequence. You can see this here, amygdala the parabacampal gyrus, and also in the coronal view. So this is the um, setting as already described. This is the incision, left-sided positioning of the patient, using uh, also neuro navigation. So the first um, um, step is um, dividing the sylvian fissure, preserving the superficial sylvian veins. and then resection of the tumor, also using, um, beside your anatomical knowledge, using also the uh, neural navigation. Then this is the membrane of the um, internal carotid artery, which is uh, divided, this internal carotid artery, this is the optic nerve. And this is the chiasmatic cistern, coming here and in the optic carotid window, which is wide in this case, you can see the pituitary stalk. So uh, more posterior, you see the uh, carotid, internal carotid artery bifurcation with the A1 and the M1 uh, branches. Going more posterior, you see the posterior clinoid process, the oculomotor nerve, uh, of course, in this, uh, these cases, the cues is of great help to resect these tumors and your navigation, as I said already. And this is the trochlea nerve beside, be, beyond the uh, tentorial incisura, and this is the posterior um, uh, cerebral artery. You see here the um, PCOM joining the posterior cerebral artery. You see then the um, um, basilar artery bifurcation and the um, contralateral oculomotor nerve. And endoscopically, you see this, of course, it's um, much more beautiful than with, with the microscope, usually basilar artery, the contralateral um, posterior cerebral artery, um, superior cerebellar artery, oculomotor nerve, ipsilateral superior cerebellar artery, the um, Motor nerve ipsilateral, the trochlea nerve, as um, shown before. This is the retroclival space with the posterior clinoid processes, the um, 
basilar artery, basilar artery bifurcation, posterior cerebral artery, and in between the um, oculomotor um, um, carotid window, you see the pituitary stalk entering the pituitary gland. So uh, the histologically turned to be out um, um, uh, diffuse glioma, grade two. Um, postoperatively, there was cessation of uh, epilepsy. And this is the pre and postoperative MRI in the flared sequence and uh, the resection of uh, the tumor. So I would uh, just uh, show one um, aneurysm case or vascular, uh, neurovascular case, because uh, this will be more in depth uh, uh, presented by Professor Lawton. Um, this is a 68 year old patient with an up unruptured right uh, MCA and basilar artery aneurysm. You see the uh, 3D uh, angiography preoperatively showing the MCA and showing the basilar artery aneurysm. This is the pteroneal setting, the pteroneal approach, opening, reduction of the lesser ring of the sphenoid. This is the meningo orbital band here, which is uh, then coagulated and cut, giving you also more space. Then further the dissection of the sylvian fissure. Going more posterior, this is the uh, tentorial incisura. This is the liliquist membrane. And this was an uh, incidental discovery uh, intraoperative blister aneurysm, which was not shown um, during angiography. And then a preparation of the MCA um, aneurysm, which originates from the temporal um, M2 branch and also preserving the, um, the perforating uh, branches. and clipping the aneurysm, opening it, and then you see that there's still bleeding, so it is not fully occluded, putting a temporary clip on the temporal, uh, temp, uh, temporal M2 branch, repositioning of the clip, and now it is occluded. Then performing ICG angiography to see the patency of the uh, parent vessels and also the preservation of the um, uh, end arteries beside complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Then going further posteriorly to the basilar artery aneurysm, which is here, and the, uh, the posterior cerebral artery arteries on both sides. This is the uh, um, opposite uh, oculomotor nerve. ICG angiography before clipping. Then clipping, you, you recognize that there is no retractor uh, inserted, and this is the clip from the previous uh, MCA aneurysm. Very important preservation of the thalamic perforating um, arteries. They, they should not be included into the clip. Shown here, coming up um, out from the uh, P1 segment. And this is the contralateral side, it has to be checked. So this is the view after clipping, this is the um, ICG angiography after clipping, showing a complete occlusion of the uh, basilar artery aneurysm. 
and also showing the preservation of the, um, the uh, thalamoperforating arteries. So this is the um, 3D angiography after clipping, the MCA aneurysm and the basilar artery aneurysm. And this is the patient uh, seven days after surgery at the day of uh, discharge having no deficits. So this is another patient with a large um, insular glioma, 36 year old uh, man who had uh, increasing headache and uh, suffered from motor aphasia. And this led to the, at the hospital admission as, a, as an emergency because he yeah, could not uh, talk. He probably also had from the, um, the history uh, epileptic fits, um, at least two. And you see on the flare sequences, you can see this uh, tumor which involves the insular region and um, spreads away the um, MCA branches. This is the coronal view after contrast enhancement. You see that the tumor took up the, um, the contrast, so probably indicating that it is a malignant tumor. See also the midline shift. This is the operative setting. The patient decided to cut all his hair. So this is the intraoperative monitoring. This is the incision. This is a modified incision, uh, but involving the uh, pleuronal region. So this is, uh, I use um, flare and um, T1 contrast enhanced neural navigation for these tumors. This is the tumor, which is actually spreading apart the um, sylvian fissures. So, um, uh, so it gives way for you to, to dissect and remove it. So this is a vascular a tumor which is first uh, internally decompressed. And uh, then actually the most part of the surgery is uh, uh, skeletonization of the, um, of the um, tree, the vascular tree. If you've got a bleeding, uh, you must not immediately coagulate. You can wait, this stopped uh, spontaneously. Of course, the cues is of great help to remove these uh, tumors. Uh, in this case, 5 ala was of no help. There was no fluorescence of, observed. You see the um, M1 branch here, uh, the M, M1 segment here. So this is the tumor very intimately um, uh, involving the vessels, very adherent, but could be separated. Uh, very fleshy tumor. So also this, you have to take care of any branches. Uh, you have to you should see if they're entering the tumor or if they are going into the depths to the striatum. I changed the sucking device. It is now a stimulating sucking device. And you can see that the uh, tumor is uh, well differentiated from the brain. You can remove it here at these sites. And this is the final view after removal of the uh, of the tumor. So this is the patient on the sixth day, day of uh, discharge, he had uh, no neurological deficits. He received radiochemotherapy after, um, after um, surgery, a few months after surgery. And interestingly, also the, the speech normalized um, after surgery. So this is the MR uh, imaging, uh, pre and post-operative. And this is the T1 uh, contrast enhanced pre and post-operative. And this uh, histological was an oligodendroglioma uh, grade three. 
This is a, a patient, a 56 year old uh, lady who uh, suffered from increasing headaches since a few months. She had no neurological deficits. And uh, this uh, patient had an, an, an MRI and anterior clinoid meningioma. And these cases, beside the clinic or the increasing clinic, I recommend uh, resection of the tumor before, before it comes uh, bigger and also uh, gives a threat to the internal carotid artery and the optic nerve. So this is the MRI uh, preoperatively. Um, this tumor was resected via journal um, approach. So this is a classic journal uh, approach showing the reduction of the lesser ring of the uh, sphenoid, also meaning orbital band. Cut. And this actually uh, devascularizes. Uh, so the extra dural uh, preparation devascularizes the tumor so that the intradural part becomes uh, much easier and uh, less bloody. So in this case, the um, Referring your surgeon was the um, this was the the patient was the aunt of the referring your surgeon. He asked me not to remove the um, in, uh, the anterior clinoid, uh, which I would otherwise have done uh, in order to resect it completely according to a Simpson grade one resection. So this is then the intradural part. You have to uh, keep the dura. Moist in, in order to, to um, close it afterwards, then intradural resection of the tumor, devascularization first. And very important in these uh, patients or in these cases is to preserve the arachnoid um, layer and arachnoid membrane. internal decompression of the tumor. Also, you see this arachnoid here, which is uh, preserved. You sh it should not be disrupted. You see, you see the olfactory nerve here. And this is opening the chiasmatic cistern, release of um, CSF and uh, um, so gaining more space and you should be very careful when removing the tumor, as in this case, you can see that there are still vessels attached, which uh, should be um, um, yeah, um, not disrupted. So this is um, after section of the tumor, this is the optic nerve, internal carotid artery. This is a problem in these tumors. There may be um, intracanalicular parts of the tumor. So, but uh, I was not allowed actually to to open and resect the, this part. So um, then afterwards, the resection of the dura of the involved dura. This is the space you gain without any retraction um, after removal of the tumor and actually the tumor was uh, creating it. So then uh, performing neuroplasty. This is the MRI pre and post operatively showing complete removal of the tumor, early post operative MRI in the coronal view uh, complete removal, and this is the patient uh, uh, on the fifth day um, before discharge and uh, traveling back to her country.
So, um, of course, in the last case, I was not allowed to perform an extra dural anterior kinodectomy, but you can perform it. This is another patient, just uh, to show you uh, this part of the surgery also without any retraction, removing the dura. Then um, unroofing of the um, optic canal. I like to use uh, one millimeter uh, um, uh, ranges and um, and uh, the drill, the combination of both. Then hollowing out the anterior clinoid process. In order to gain more space, I have opened the chiasmatic cistern here. So I've got space, and this is the anterior clinoid process, uh, which is removed. This is the optic strut between the internal carotid artery and the um, optic nerve. And then this is the um, oculomotor carotid membrane or the uh, proximal dura ring where you can stimulate uh, the oculomotor nerve. So this is an, another example where you can show you that uh, the extension, the frontal extension, um, in order to, to gain uh, access to the anterior frontal uh, base. This is a patient who had an um, incident uh, dif discovery of a sphenoid wing and a small olfactory groove meningioma, 40 years old, and uh, which on follow-up showed growth. So this is uh, after one year, it, uh, it was growing this tumor. <coughs> Also in the coronal view, you see this very small olfactory groove meningioma, but which was also wrong. And she asked for removing these uh, tumors due to growth. And <clears throat> she, she, since she's 40 years old, so she's a young lady, uh, um, I, I think this is a good choice. Uh, I'm only showing the uh, frontal extension. So this is the olfactory groove uh, meningioma. Also, no need for any retraction. I think this is safer also to preserve the olfactory nerve. Of course, here you open the olfactory cistern. You can see here the olfactory nerve. Tumor is separated. So this is the olfactory nerve and this is the tumor which is being removed. Coagulation of the base. So this is the MRI pre and post operatively showing complete removal of the um, of the tumor. And interesting, I, I actually I was focused on the uh, sphenoid wing meningioma. I did not uh, um, perform an olfactory test. And uh, during follow-up, the patient uh, said spontaneously uh, that uh, she can now smell. And so this is one of the rare cases where uh, there was an amelioration of the olfaction, which is um, not very often seen. So uh, my take uh, home message for you is um, uh, avoidance of uh, fixed brain retractors can aid in protecting the brain. Um, you have to um, uh, have a deep uh, anatomical knowledge uh, and uh, also you need experience. You cannot shift from, uh, from retractor to retractorless. Uh, a surgery uh, uh, within one day because the space is small and is more focused and targeted. Uh, so, um, so you have this needs time. I, I needed also my time to uh, to perform this uh, over years. So the main instruments in this is the suction device. Uh, this is a normal suction device as I've shown you, and the bipolar. In the article of Professor Spetzler, they developed a special instrumentarium, uh, which I think is not uh, needed. And uh, the main help is, of course, the CSF egress, um, uh, uh, because this gives you the space. 
On the other hand, in tumor cases, the lesion itself, the tumor gives you uh, the space um, you need to resect the tumor. And I think the pteronal approach is ideal for retractless uh, microsurgery because there's an abundance of uh, basal cisterns, uh, so uh, the CSF egress is uh, very well, and you gain a lot of space and uh, do not need any retractants. So thank you very much for your attention. This is uh, in winter time. This, this is uh, uh, how Bavaria looks at this time. So, Same, you want me to start the questions now? Discussion. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Goel. Okay, okay. So essentially, you know, tyrional craniotomy is one of the very important surgical step in our neurosurgical life. We have to do tyrional craniotomy all the time. And to do it right and to do it perfectly is very important. To be able to save the branches of the facial nerve is important. To do a dissection in the manner that all the branches of the vascular supply to the temporalis muscle is retained is very important. Because if you damage the facial nerve, you have a problem with the forehead. And if you damage the arteries of the temporalis muscle, you damage, you result in quite a devastating wasting of the muscle. So beautiful demonstration of the anatomical concepts which I saw in Dr. Abida's presentation and how this dissection, how this tyrional craniotomy has been used, has been beautifully shown by Dr. Bassioni. So I have not too many questions in the list, but what one question is there, how do you open the sylvan fissure from lateral to medial or medial to lateral? You want to answer that, Dr. Bassioni? Yes, I, um, actually, depends on the case, um, because in some patients, um, um, I'm looking for the, the area where uh, I, I'm not entering the superficial sylvan veins. And in some uh, patients, this may be more from the proximal part of the sylvan fissure, which is usually wider. Um, and uh, in some cases, it is uh, from the distal part of the sylvian fissure. And uh, uh, Professor Erjagin has described uh, four different types of sylvian fissures, uh, which uh, so the, uh, the difficulty may vary from patient to patient. But um, I think to give the surgery a good start, you should avoid entering the superficial sylvian veins. Um, and so this is the main focus, though so, um, it, it is uh, different from patient to patient, I would say it like. So the essentially, you know, tyrional craniotomy was one of the major, major contributions of Professor Yasergil, who used this tyrional craniotomy for aneurysm surgery in a big way. He started... Uh, and he used it for various aneurysms at various sites. Now, I want to ask Dr. Abida, what do you think, you know, if you have to summarize how to save the facial nerve branches, can you just summarize in two or three sentences just to repeat what you have said? Save the facial nerve branches above the superior temporal line remain subpericranial. Below the superior temporal line remain beneath the deep temporal fascia and reflect everything anteriorly, and you will save the fish, frontal branches of the fish. Okay, so the other question that I would like to ask you is, uh, some people like to mobilize the temporalis muscle from posterior to anterior, some anterior to posterior, and some downwards. Now, of course, this will depend on what kind of cases you are doing. For aneurysm, of course, you will like to have it away from the tyrional region. Essentially, my question is how, which is the best method to rotate the temporalis muscle to save its vasculature? I think rotating it posteriorly and inferiorly in, a, in that direction will save its vasculature 
best because the vasculature comes from the inferior aspect of the zygomatic arch and anteriorly anteriorly at the base so if you reflect it in the posterior and inferior direction you will save the vascular supply completely and you will get a very good exposure <clears throat> so essentially you have to say both the superior te superficial temporal artery and its branches and deep temporal arteries which are anterior posterior and medial and its branches so if you have to save the deep temporal branches you have to go sub periosteal on the squamal bone rather than entering into the muscle and damaging those arteries and yes. try to rotate the temporalis muscle without too much coagulation is that correct yes sir yes sir i agree to this anything else you want to say dr baswani regarding temporal regarding tyrional craniotomy i'm um, actually i was uh, for many years uh, um, using uh, three burr holes as the original or yeah. traditional teaching and um, I think I have no go, uh, not got a proof for, for this, but I think that uh, you can um, uh, um, um, avoid the frontal uh, burr hole, the so-called key burr hole. So I'm personally, since uh, many years, I'm performing it only a temporal burr hole, where the the um, the bone is thinnest and which is deepest to the uh, to the temporal muscle so this is very well covered by the muscle and this is my only burr hole and then i'm going around from this burr hole um, uh, and performing the peroneal craniotomy um, the fir the uh, at first you put the fear to enter the dura um, without the uh, the uh, anterior burr hole but actually this is in practically practically not happening more than it would happen even with a burr hole. Uh, so um, I'm. I think maybe this is uh, this has uh, cosmetic uh, advantages um, because the, the most um, uh, cosmetic uh, disadvantage is is a depression, which is uh, I think resection of this area, the bony area, and the second reason is the atrophy of the uh, temporal uh, muscle. Uh, and as you said, uh, you have to preserve the um, uh, neurovascular structures. And um, I'm also performing dissection of the temporal muscle from the posterior uh, to the anterior and from superior to the inferior region. So in order to preserve this uh, superiority. Yeah, I completely agree with you. The other thing that I am concerned about whilst making one barole or two barole or sometimes three barole will be the age factor. You see, if the person is quite older and uh, if, you may, if you try to, you know, compromise on the number of baroles, you may have, you know, quite a bit of damage to the dura sometimes at least. And that damage may be troublesome, if not difficult, but troublesome to uh, handle at the later stage. So in older people, I prefer to make more than one bar hole for sure. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, this may be a very important thing. In young people, younger age, the dura is strong, the plane of dissection is okay, and you can make with the craniotome quite a good with one single bar hole. So that may be one additional step. So essentially, the basal tyrional craniotomy going right up to the base of the sphenoid bone. And then, you know, even uh, Vinko Dolan dis described and he made, was made absolutely famous by one surgical step. And that surgical step was removing the anterior clinoid process. The way you have to remove the anterior clinoid process, the way you drill, the way you handle the cranial nerves, the way you understand the relationship of the third cranial nerve to the anterior clinoid process, to the optic nerve to the anterior clinoid process, the dural rings of, in the proximity to the anterior clinoid process are all these factors which will be absolutely critical when you are drilling the anterior clinoid process. So one is tyrional craniotomy, second is basal tyrional craniotomy, 
Third is anterior clonoid drilling, and that opens the book of skull base. And that is what is the basic neurosurgical step that we have learned today and in very beautiful manner. So Samay, you want to go to the next speaker now? Is there any other comment from the panelists? I will be happy to hear some more comments. Uh, Professor Gore, not a comment, but I read another question uh, for uh, the panelists and also for you directly. Uh, what about the rule of a CSF drainage, uh, such as lumbar drainage, to keep more space? Yeah, that is a very important. You know what? This is, I consider this as a very important surgical step. What question you are as asking? is absolutely important. And I consider it important more for tumors. Suppose I'm doing cavernous sinus tumor. Suppose I'm doing trigeminal neurinoma. I'm doing basal work. In those situations, I will certainly like to have a CSF drainage because I will be able to retract my basal temporal when I'm working behind, not exactly in the sylvian fissure, behind the sylvian fissure in the basal base of the temporal brain, in the extradural or intradural exposure to the cavernous sinus, to the petroclival area. In those, in those surgeries, I will certainly like to have CSF drainage. However, in cases of aneurysms and all, there is actually no need to have lumbar drainage of CSF because you can open the cisterns of uh, subarachnoid cisterns in the sylvian fissure and you can certainly avoid lumbar drainage because the position also will not be will be quite cumbersome if you are doing tyrional craniotomy and keeping the patient lateral it may be a little bit difficult so i will like to have the comment of dr basuni on this what do you think dr basuni i'm, I'm afraid to answer <laughs> because I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm not using uh, lumbar drainage at all, um, neither in the posterior Forza cases nor in the anterior, um, um, also not in the, in the tumor cases. And um, um, as I've shown you on, the, on the, some examples that I tried to reach uh, the um, S fast as possible the cisterns. Uh, sometimes, of course, you have got 